So uh, this isn't an example of blended learning because this was a unit, Principles of Economics, which was delivered entirely online. So uh, my initial uh, thinking about this, uh, not being experienced with this at all, was to start with the idea of if our students were chained to their desks at home, would it be possible to deliver a Principles of Economics unit to them in a way that would enable them to be approximately as successful uh, as if they were coming to the campus? So, obviously, to get that up and running, I had to team with one of the blended learning people, and that was Paul McMullen, who is also the world's greatest dad. Um, <laughs> the way we started that was to not, uh, in a sense, it's the, um, the, the opposite to Colin's approach. So we didn't jump in the deep end, mainly because I'm very risk averse to drowning. So I, <laughs> we were paddling in the shallow end, really. So, started with thinking about what kind of tools do we have available to us which are easily usable, I know what they are, I know how they work, I know how I can use them, and then try and build with that rather than think what do we want and then look for tools later and discover that they're there or not there and maybe it will or won't work. Start with what we know we've got. So that was views as a content delivery platform. There were open access lectures and practice quizzes on the internet for economics that we knew we could use. There was the publisher's website or web environment called My Econ Lab. If you're familiar with Pearson's, uh, a lot of, I think they have one for, for mathematics, and maybe a couple of others as well. Uh, in which they have quizzes available and an e-text. Um, they have news items for economics, they have daily news items uh, culled from uh, uh, well, the Australian, predominantly not from the Sydney Morning Herald for some reason. Um, and they have a couple of uh, games as well, uh, economics games, not exactly the kind of games were talked about in the previous presentation. These are far less entertaining. They're explicit, dull learning tools. So, um, and the uh, e-textbook and webinars. So we knew we could use all of these things. The accessible tasks that were chosen were three online quizzes that were staggered throughout the, this is over summer I should say, so it's over an eight week period. Um, three quizzes, online quizzes. Students were required to uh, develop a blog in which they were, they were assigned a particular type of topic and then they were required, really like writing a blog, to investigate that and to um, investigate that particular topic and to develop their thoughts on that topic progressively by writing blog entries in the way that real, there's a lot of economists today who, who maintain blogs. Um, so in a kind of a real, uh, a simulation of what a lot of economists today actually do. So John Quiggin, for example, maintains a blog. Steve Keen maintains a blog. Paul Krugman maintains, there's lots of economists who do that. Um, they're also required to, in addition to develop their own blog, to require, they were required to comment on other people's blogs and they were also required to comment on the discussion board for particular topics that were, had been created. They were meant to talk to each other about those particular topics. Um, and then there was a final exam. And the content was predominantly these forms, recorded on-campus lectures from a previous semester were made available to the students. So there's a series of lectures for on-campus in autumn and spring. The students for summer could access those. 
since the, 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 the topics were essentially the same, it's just condensed in time, basically. Uh, the creation of YouTube videos that were tailored particularly to uh, fill gaps that students felt or I felt were there. Uh, Utilise professional online lectures such as the Khan Academy, there's Khan Academy video clips and something from Education Portal. Stimulus material from blogs and for blogs and lectures which students could utilise to uh, pique their interest or to provide them with information to kind of give them direction. Uh, and that's from videos, articles, web addresses and so on. And then the textbook from the e-textbook from Pearson's. So that's pretty much the unit, the bare bones of the unit online to be taught over eight weeks. Uh, the tools, the tasks and the content. So I went into this with some expectations. Uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that within the discipline of economics and finance, um, the views, on, views about blended learning and online learning range from mm, cautious to, <laughs> to put it politely, sceptical. So, I'm at the cautious end, so, uh, but uh, nonetheless I did have some, I had some preconceptions which weren't really confirmed or were disconfirmed by my experience with online learning. So the first of these actually was uh, an expectation which was confirmed and the expectation was that students who were more experienced would do better with online learning. And so here we've got the total marks for the unit and credit points, that which is telling you about the experience, degree of experience of students. So towards the end they're finishing their degree. The lesser credit units there in the beginning of their degree. And if you get a line of best fit, which is not a great line, nonetheless it's a pos there's a positive relationship to some extent. If we use a slightly snazzier line of best fit, there's clearly a positive relationship for first year and clearly a positive relationship for third year and not much of a relationship for second year for some reason, if we use this. But the R squareds here are not high, so this isn't really great correlations anyway. Perhaps what I wasn't expecting so much was that uh, first year students would do quite badly. Um, so there's one, it's one thing to say there's a positive relationship, it's another thing to say that students who are at the beginning will tend to fail. You could have your positive relationship up here above the 50% line. But it went from below the 50% line to above it. So if you start with basically third year students, most of them are doing quite well. Almost all of them pass and do very well. For second year students, you get a range and for, third year, for first year students, the, the bulk of students who failed were first year students who decided to do the unit online which probably is something that needs to be thought about if we're going to move to a completely online kind of approach in the future because it seems at this stage, this is a fairly small sample, this is only 100 students, um, so it's not really statistically significant. But nonetheless, if this relationship bears out with larger percentages of students, it's something we have to seriously consider for developing an online approach for first year especially because either it means we're going to have very large fail rates or it means we'll have to lower our standards for what counts as a fail. The second expectation was that the majority of students who were doing this unit were students who had failed in the past and were trying to catch up. 
that was just wrong. 98% of the students who did the online unit were non-repeating students, students who had not done the unit before, but instead had postponed the unit for some reason or other. Not, they hadn't failed it, they'd, post, they'd withdrawn from it or just not done it at all for some reason. So only 2% of the students had failed this unit in the past. Which was, I, which was completely the opposite to what I thought would be the case. I thought this was going to be a bunch of students who were kind of serial failers and it was going to be really hard to get them over the line and that just wasn't the case. Almost none of them were. And the majority of them were second or third year students. The third expectation was that the students would be highly motivated. So I went, uh, as a little bit of background research, I went and had a look at, what, at the videos on... Uh, the UWS YouTube site for summer semester and there was, there's a video there on why students do the summer semester and all of them said they did summer semester because they wanted to catch up or they wanted to finish their degree earlier. So these seem to be go-getter students, students who really want to get ahead, students who want to finish quickly. Students want to, you know, get on with their lives, so they, ha they have a high degree of motivation, perhaps. And that was also borne out in the comments asking students at the beginning of the semester why they were doing the unit. Almost all of them said, because I want to finish early. So, it turns out that was completely wrong. Uh, students turned, maybe at the very beginning, they were highly motivated or believed they were highly motivated but in fact were not by halfway through or towards the end. So the most difficult or challenging aspects da -da -da -da, was having to motivate myself and teaching myself everything from textbooks and learning off the videos from the lecturer. I procrastinated with all of the tasks and found reading the textbook on my own very boring. The hardest part was being able to focus during summer when it was amazing weather and I didn't want to be outside. <laughs> Getting motivated and dedicated enough, you know, one of the problems was getting motivated and dedicated enough to stay on top of everything. Keeping motivated and sticking to self-allocated studying time. I discovered that I do not have a di the discipline to study externally. When we looked at a mind map of what were the, the biggest difficulties with the unit, m motivation was the number one problem that students themselves identified staying motivated. This was despite the fact that there were kind of little mm, carrots slash sticks throughout the only eight weeks to kind of keep them coming back and keeping them motivated. That didn't seem to have a massive effect or if it did have a massive, it would have been even worse if those weren't there. I thought that the students would really value and take advantage of the professionally developed, specifically tailored online material for economic students from my econ lab, the, the publisher, a multi-billion dollar industry where they spend millions of dollars on developing material for economic students, Khan Academy, which is now extremely well known and very popular, and the Education Portal Academy. Um, of these, academics themselves, such as myself and my colleagues, some of my colleagues anyway, think Khan Academy is great. We really like it. Unfortunately, the students thought it was, uh, they didn't like it at all. So as one student put it, online videos used from other resources were a great turn off. They didn't like them at all. They were not so much disappointed by them as uh, mildly disgusted by their existence. <laughs> Here's from most useful to least useful. You can see that the stuff from Khan Academy and from the Pearson's MyLab material were predominantly regarded as borderline useless for the majority of students. A very small percentage of students found them use, the most useful. So this is contrary to the hype that comes from those very entities which create these products and that's not hard to understand uh, because they have a vested interest in marketing 
themselves because they're selling a product. There's usually money behind the quote-unquote research that's done on behalf of these entities by themselves, on themselves. Um, if you try and be a bit more objective about it, it seems that students themselves don't necessarily think it's that fantastic. Academics sometimes do, but the students don't necessarily think it's great. Do you know if the students actually looked at them? Were they useful because they looked at them or useful because they didn't look at them and they were they, they seem to have looked at them but not stuck with them. So uh, they, they obviously didn't persist with them and, and that makes sense too. If you didn't think something was useful, you're not going to keep going back to watch it. Yep. Very quickly. <laughs> No, there was no activities or video, activities around the videos per se, so they didn't have to watch the video and then they had to do a quiz based on the video. This is external material. Yeah. The education portal material, ironic, the education portal material has videos and then, you, then with those videos are quizzes to go with it. Students thought those were the worst. Not the best. So it's not as if, well, if there was more interaction with them, then they'd be really more engaged. No, didn't. they weren't interested in that at all. In fact, they seem to dislike that. Maybe it's, well, and maybe there's a punchline to this. I'm misleading you down the garden path a little bit. Okay, so the punchline, I think, might be that it's got nothing to do with any of that. I think it may have something to do with the fact that the material was perceived to be external and perceived to be second-hand stuff that I'd pinched from the web, which seemed a bit slack, like I hadn't made much of an effort. Whereas for the material that I had developed for myself, they thought that was extremely useful. <coughs> Even though the stuff that I developed for myself was very amateurish. Right? But I think the couple of things, one, it was... It, Maybe, perhaps, I'm not sure about this, and I think this requires further research, perhaps the amateurishness is something that was actually attractive about it. Yeah? Right. So I, I think students got the feeling that there was something more personal about it, that the lecturer was creating something almost in real time that they was made for them. So there was a sense of connection between the lecturer and the students which is impossible to achieve for something which is manifestly not created for them, personally. Yep. Maybe they're using more colours. Sorry. No, maybe they're using more colours by the fact that they expect you to be stepping in the of what you're saying is much more valuable to them than mm. anything that they're going to find around. Yeah. Yes, that could be true. However, you have to bear in mind this is economics. So, it means <laughs> what I'm talking about <laughs> is not somehow fundamentally different to what's on Khan Academy. In fact, I think, as an academic, what's done on Khan Academy for some of the material is in some ways better than what I'm doing it, the way I'm explaining it. Well, not explaining it, but they're able to draw things and I don't have the technology for that. So... Yeah, I, I think if, but I think that this is a purely subjective thing. It's not, if the student was standing back and saying, OK, tell me the difference in content between these two things, they wouldn't be able to tell me the difference because there's no difference in content. If I'm teaching the Keynesian expenditure model, there's, there's limits to how, how much you can tailor it to make it purely individual. I mean, there's, you know, it is what it is. So... I think it has something to do with the, the messenger rather than the message. Yeah? Do you know? Mm. 
you know, even if the academic is providing that as the font of knowledge is saying you should watch this video and say no, it didn't come from you, therefore it's not real, and while simultaneously saying you're the font of knowledge. <laughs> To be the creator of the knowledge, exactly. not the person who just vets knowledge but creates it somehow. Yeah. We're a little bit out of time, but I'm going to keep going. So students, uh, students will take to this stuff like uh, a duck takes to water because of the students who did my did this unit, three quarters of them were born after the recession we had to have by Paul Keating. Right. So when Apple comes out with uh, when you know, 1984 is not going to be like 1984, their famous ad for the new Apple computer, these students were six years away from being born. They, their entire conscious existence has had the internet. So I thought that this would be the case. So it's not so much ducks to water as a case of babes in the woods a little bit, uh, mainly because it seems that the, uh, that the students really have grown up with the internet. That is, as children they've grown up with the internet and as children they use the internet as toys and as a social, means of social interaction, not so much as a tool for generating knowledge or acquiring knowledge in a systematic, timetabled fashion. So, uh, students are familiar with reading blogs and wikis and so on, but are not so much with writing them or how you would go about doing that or, how, or creating wiki pages that are presentable in some way. And they'll ask, well, how do you do that? I don't know how to start. What do you do? Um, even though they've grown up seeing them throughout their lives. Navigating between views and external sources seems for some percentage of students to be a difficult issue. There's always software gremlins. There's, some of those gremlins are absolutely real and some of them from the, uh, are fictitious. That is, students will report that I couldn't access the quiz at this time, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that's true. Uh, maybe it's not true. It's very hard to tell for a student who might be a bit, um, how would you say, uh, lackadaisical about getting things done on time. Creating the... Uh, Okay, all right, so I'll just quickly finish up and say creating the vids was uh, very time consuming. So uh, I thought it would be pretty quick. So a 20 minute vid will take around about 20 minutes to make and that's just not the case, <laughs> even remotely. Uh, so on my calculations, on average, uh, the time spent on a vid roughly equals the video's length times four. So that's preparing slides, recording the thing, redoing when you've made mistakes, editing, uploading, and then redoing the whole thing when something goes missing in the transition from your computer to uh, uh, YouTube or something like that, and it just disappears somehow, or your computer freezes or something like that. <laughs> yes, well, I've had help with that, but it's, uh, some things just uh, disappear. All right, I'll stop there. Um, and hand it back.